Yeah, so. I find it interesting that um, so as a with a Baptist background, I would always think something like, you know, these Catholics they they take a vow of celibacy. What would they know about marriage? Mm. And then, like what you're saying about what John Paul II has put out seems very profound. And then I have also read a lot of uh, Richard Rohr's information, who's also Franciscan friar, who also has a vow of celibacy. I'm like, as a Baptist, I'd be like, what can he possibly know? But it turns out that he's got some very profound and very helpful things that have very much helped my wife and I. Mm. <laughs> so it's this uh, strange, ironic thing. I know thing. you think about it, but I'm like, well... If you're a priest and you're hearing confessions day after day after day, you you get to become very familiar with human nature and relationships. Yeah, but also gain some real insights. You get some really good uh, interactive practice, like how to practice interactively and in a non egoic way, because you're dealing with somebody about offenses that aren't really against you personally. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody recently said that. I was listening. I can't remember. It was, it was somebody that stemmed from the intellectual dark web. They said that uh, therapy has become the secular replacement for confession. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It is. <laughs> and like therapists are treated like the priests. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know. Um, integrated attraction is rooted in seeing the necessity of the other. Mm -hmm. So. That means I need to have a good attachment with the other sex as well as enough of attachment with my own sex so that I, I don't experience a deficit within myself that I need to have my mm. masculinity affirmed. Mm. So if that is not adequately there by the time puberty comes, then my sexual urge is going to direct itself toward where I see the greatest deficit. So, so it's very important for young men to have men in their lives to model masculinity for them and to instill that in them yeah to accept I mean, them as they are as men and affirm that in them so they, they have a recognition even if i'm different than a lot of other guys i'm still secure enough that i am a man i have I am i am a good i'm meant to be a good gift yeah yeah so a lot of the work we do is in helping identify where those distortions are and uh kind of especially when there are certain key moments, key memories, even their frequent experiences uh, with the type of therapy I do, which is reintegrative therapy. Uh, we reprocess those experiences that were fundamental in developing a, our insecure sense of gender mass, uh, like gender identity and security. And so well, I want you to, maybe I want to try to re-say that. Um, reintegrative therapy Mm -hmm. So you're going back and you're helping somebody reprocess those developmental things that they may have missed. Correct. Now that sounds, that sounds extremely helpful for probably for anybody to yeah. be able to go do that. Um, yeah. And that's why we present reintegrative therapy as just a trauma and addictions therapy. And we find that it's helpful for men who are looking to explore fluidity in their sexual attractions. So it's, but the reality is I use reintegrative therapy techniques with clients with same-sex attraction, with heterosexual sexual addiction issues, with fetishes, uh, with any sort of trauma issue. So it's... What, so what is that? What is reintegrative therapy techniques? What is that? So uh, it's kind of a combination of uh, adaptive information processing therapy techniques like EMDR or FLASH. Yep. Yep. Visual schema displacement. I've heard therapy. of EMDR. I haven't heard of Flash. Flash is uh, developed by Philip Manfield. It's uh, it was started off as like a shortcut for EMDR, okay. where instead of focusing on the memory over and over, you can reprocess the memory um, more subliminally without mm -hmm. directly thinking about it the whole time. Mm -hmm. So you use a positive focus, and you're doing bilateral stimulations and then blinking while focusing yep. on something positive, and then you go back to the original memory which is still mm -hmm. in the working memory because you bring it up you get a sensor to the stress and you go back to that so we work on either the trauma but we can also use the same techniques that we use in uh trauma reprocessing to also reprocess uh arousal templates so where you oh, have wow. like a memory that has trauma embedded in it we also have memories that have arousal embedded in them 
and you can use the same reprocessing techniques to basically dissolve the arousal experience that's associated with that memory or experience. So we so use. Would Would you know? Would you know if you had arousal that was a so? What What if you have arousal that's attached to an experience or a memory, but you're not aware of that attachment. Does that happen? You have to find that? Yeah, so we use, we actually work backwards. So, so the standard reintegrative therapy protocol is we actually invite the client to bring up an arousal experience. Okay. So maybe a fantasy or maybe an actual sexual experience. Mm -hmm. This is what kind of makes this particular type of therapy uh, kind of difficult for a lot of conservatives because right, they're like well right. don't we aren't we supposed to flee sexual morality and like right, our instinct right. as even Christians the thought of, a lot of time, yeah yeah is to suppress and squash anything associated with the same sex attraction that we're trying to change mm -hmm. so there's another aspect of what we do is we we present reintegrative therapy as a mindful approach okay so it's when another bad word. People are afraid of the word mindful. I know. Yeah, it's another triggering <laughs> one. But I explained this is not so Zen Buddhism. Crazy. It is about developing mastery over your attention, what you pay attention to, and to be able to self-regulate in doing that. So, yeah, Amy Gilchrist calls attention a moral act, what yeah. you attend to. Yeah. So what we explained to clients at the outset is we're neither taking a pro-gay approach to your same-sex attraction where – Oh, if I feel attraction, I should affirm that, that this means I'm gay, I have a sexual orientation, mm -hmm. and that I should explore this and embrace it. No, we're not going to take a pro-gay approach, nor are we taking an anti-gay approach, where if I feel the attractions or have the urges that I'm going to shame myself and suppress it and bounce my eyes, all this stuff. Right. We tell them we're going to take a mindful approach, where we're going to look into the attractions, into mm -hmm. the arousal experiences, even the behavior. Mm -hmm. And use that as our guide into what the un underlying needs, desires, and wounds are. Mm -hmm. So with the standard reintegrative protocol, we have a few protocols that we've, we're developing or ha have developed. The standard one is where we go to the fantasy or the, the arousal experience. And we ask them to find the peak moment and really try to get into it. Like actually invite them, feel the feelings as, as intensely as you can. Mm -hmm. So go to that peak moment. And, and then I gauge zero to 10, how arousing is the, is the experience right now? Okay. I want the most arousing experience. And so maybe it's like, oh, I'm having sex with this guy. And okay. So then we invite them to do a gaze inversion. Uh, the main point is to get them to certain levels of awareness. So that, when you say gaze, you're talking about G-A-Z-Y, G-A-Z-E? Uh, G-A-Z-E. So I asked them to imagine yeah. at that peak moment, if they were able to step outside their body and then look into their own eyes at that moment. Mm. So mm. as they're like in that euphoric moment, what do they see when they look into their own face? And we just ask them, just keep looking without judging and describe, just describe what you see. Without judging is important. Yeah. And the first level awareness will usually be what we call uh, a trance state where it's the most euphoric experience. And maybe there's a feeling state associated with it. Like I'm powerful or I'm wanted I'm loved, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And then as they peer into it more, we might ask more, okay, so we might get a sense of what they're looking for, uh, or they might just come up on their own, and they get a sense of this next level of awareness is what they're desiring. I'm mm -hmm. desiring to be wanted by this man, to mm -hmm. be affirmed. And then the third level is, is might be what is the wound underneath that? Because then it might be, well, what is it like to desire it but not have it? Mm. When have you not felt Oh, then that brings it to the pain. And so let me just invite them. Okay, get in touch with that feeling, the pain the, of, of not getting that need met. When, what's the earliest time you can remember that? Earliest or at least the most profound? The earlier the better, of course. So they go back to that. So now we're out of the fantasy, and now we're into a memory. And maybe okay. it's a time that they're being bullied or abused, rejected, ostracized, excluded, etc. And that's where then we use some sort of trauma reprocessing approach. And so we reprocess trauma. It might be with EMDR. I don't use EMDR as much as I used to. Uh, I might do something like flash. Or one of my favorites is to use just um, uh, image transformation therapy mm -hmm. or uh, mindful self-compassion, where you mm -hmm. imagine them stepping into the memory. So they see mm -hmm. their younger self. And you imagine yourself as the adult stepping into the memory. And you, you're going to be like the big brother that you never had. 
and you're going like to interact IFS a little bit, huh? Yeah. Yeah. A bit like IFS. And so you're going to give yourself the compassion that you didn't get in that memory. Yes. And that's oftentimes one of the most powerful experiences and sometimes the most difficult. So sometimes I hunker down there with clients. I work with a guy right now who he cannot go into, he cannot look at his younger self. And there's such a disconnect. Right. And, right. Well, that's what we're going to work on. So he, and I had clients who, for their first reaction is to want to go into the memory of their younger self and slap their younger self. Oh, and wow. Because of all the shame that they've internalized. And like, we got to work on that. Because if you cannot heal the boy if you don't love the boy. Mm -hmm. And it's that younger self, that inner child, that is the one who's acting out in your present day uh, unwanted sexual behaviors. He's right, emerging right. in some way in the present day. And if you, if you want that to change in the present, you've got to heal that inner child. And you can't mm -hmm. heal him if you don't love him. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, the inner child is a representation of your emotional core. Yeah. So there's like a, what I've noticed in doing shadow work is that there's a component of having to love those unwanted parts of yourself to, in order to yeah. reintegrate them because we're basically enculturated into hating certain parts of ourself. Oh, there's a part of me that would do this evil thing. So I hate it and I repress it and I'm trying to get rid of it and hide it and change yeah. it and all this. But in order to really deal with it, we have to learn to love every aspect of ourself and reintegrate it in something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So as I do that work, as we see the distress associated with that memory and they, they brought healing to it, then I go back to the arousal experience. And I ask them, go back to the peak moment. What do you notice now? And there's a sense of detachment from it. Wow. Like uh, it just doesn't do anything for me anymore. And that's why it's important to start with the arousal experience because I need to see if what we're doing actually has an impact on that. Uh -huh. Like, how do I know if this is going to work if we don't actually first get into the arousal and we can know, oh, this is a strong arousal experience? Now we go to trauma therapy and now the arousal experience. So, so you're establishing a baseline so that you can know how much effectiveness has transpired. Exactly. And so yeah. that's with our main protocol. We have other ones we do as well. Um, but the core of it is actually getting them into a state of what we call assertion, uh, where they're feeling assertion? and dealing. Yeah, assertion. Okay. So in the assertive self state is one in which you're feeling your feelings and dealing with your feelings. You're well regulated. Mm -hmm. You're connected to others. And what we know is when guys are in that state on a regular basis, the temptation of homosexuality doesn't have anything to latch on to. Hmm. So for there to for any temptation to have a pull and appeal, there has to be a lack. There has to be a need. Uh, hmm. But when you're whole enough, or at least you're dealing with your emotions properly and you're regulated, you're connected with others. You know, even if it like you have a wound that comes up, if you properly deal with it, then the temptation is going to have any pull. What mm -hmm. takes people out of that is a shame experience. Mm -hmm. or, well, and what precedes that is what we call a double bind, where yes. I feel something, but I'm not allowed to express it. I'll make if things I can, worse. If I can pause you for a second and try to uh, steal your thunder, it almost sounds like what the university was trying, the scenario of the university you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. was a before it became completely, you know, simpatico with what you were doing. It seemed like it was creating that shame and double bind and stigma. In, in other words, yes. their, their moral stance against something being the case actually winds up exacerbating it and making it worse and Correct. preventing any healing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the trouble I get into sometimes to kind of bring us to the comment section that we're interacting in is when I'm dealing with more cons other conservative Christians, they, they still propagating the shame uh, by always referring to the attractions themselves as, as, as if you committed a sin just by experiencing the attractions. Yeah. And yeah. that approach just further uh, increases the shame that's actually at the root to the attractions. Yeah. It's a shame that drives the sense that I'm not masculine enough and therefore increases the uh, desire for the opposite, the other sex, the same sex, it's in an erotic manner. Mm -hmm. It's when I feel whole enough as a man, I don't want to eroticize another male. Hmm. I want to be his friend. I want to be his mentor or like a father figure. I don't want to, I don't want to use him as an object. 
Mm -hmm. So I want to treat them as a good, you know, objective good. So when we uh, just approach this as a pure sin issue, that, oh, why do people struggle with same-sex attraction? Because of sin. And therefore, they have to repent. If that's our only way of explaining this whole issue, that's what ends up uh, ultimately, I think, leading people to more of the liberal kind of approach to this yeah, and yeah. adoption and acceptance and embrace and more affirmation or accommodation so, approaches. So, you know, speaking of the sin and the moralistic approach, I, I honestly, uh, I didn't know what to expect when we were going to start talking. And I, there was part of me that was suspecting that there would be more of a moralistic approach. And mm. I'm not hearing that at all. And I feel like I'm, I'm, admittedly learning a lot more than I, I expected to learn some things from this conversation, but it's, it's probably about four times as much as I expected. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is amazing information and, and the way you're presenting things. I mean, you're very articulate and you're explaining things in a very graspable way that make a lot of sense without being moralizing and stigmatizing. I yeah. think that's, that's very profound. 